Well, yeah, um, thanks for inviting me to speak today and thanks everyone for coming. Um, always blows my mind a little bit <laughs> hearing Mike um, speak about his work. So it's amazing to come in and um, yeah, kind of share this space with him. Um, so for those of you who don't know me already, my name's Hema um, and I'm a member of the Soft Robotics um, group. And in my work, I kind of think about robots as part of living ecosystems. So I'm going to be talking about um, a sort of couple of ideas sort of within that uh, today, both some work from, I guess, from the past and then um, what I'm sort of working on now. So I'm really interested in the way that all living organisms are subsystems within larger ecosystems. So we can see in the image here, which I'm not sure if you can see it from there so well, but it's kind of a representation of an aquatic ecosystem. And we've got lots of different things going on. There's, um, sort of energy from, from sunlight, there's exchange of chemical components between different areas of uh, the ecosystem, we've got kind of smaller organisms, um, kind of plant life at the surface of the water, and then larger organisms that eat that plant life, process the, the carbon in them, and that sort of drops down to the lower levels um, of, of the ocean. And within this space, we've also got some robotic um, agents, which are being used as part of a kind of sensory function to try and monitor the environment. And this is the sort of um, space for robots that I'm interested in, where robots can kind of be used um, in amongst natural ecosystems to help us learn more about them, to help us kind of study them and do things like predicting um, the way that the Earth's climate um, will function, but also taking inspiration from how they behave as individuals and also their kind of collective behaviour, how they sort of interact with, um, with other life forms. So what sorts of in, uh, sort of ecosystems and environments am I interested in? Um, these first sort of two are what I'm going to talk about today. So um, firstly, I'm interested in the way that robots can help us to remove contamination from um, environments, sort of aquatic environments in particular, but also how they can help us to sense components within the environments, maybe a toxin or something we might want to remove, or just a sort of substance of interest um, in that sort of setting. In the work that I'm doing at the moment, I'm also looking at um, the way that robots can sort of move over challenging terrains and importantly kind of transition between different, um, different types of terrain. Um, and then the last of these I'm actually not going to talk about at all today, but um, I wanted to kind of mention some work that I'm doing looking at robots that operate within vertical farms. And I'm really interested in this as a, a sort of model for um, an environment that exists somewhere between an open natural environment and something more like what we would create in the lab. So a sort of place where we can study robots in connection with living things, but also in quite lab based conditions. Um, and particularly for this sort of morphological computation uh, community, um, I'm doing some work with Elliot Scott and Stuart um, Thomas at uh, University of Bristol, um, where we're looking at coupling locomotion and sensing in underwater navigation. So it'd be lovely to come back and share that work with you as a group another time. But sort of thinking about these first two to start with, um, I wanted to start by talking about the salp, which is a little organism that I became really interested in a bit earlier on in, in my research. So the salp is a sort of biological carbon pump. It's a little barrel shaped zooplankton that lives in the water column and it moves by this highly efficient sort of jet propulsion. It's got radial bands of muscle around its body. It takes in fluids through one large opening at one end and it expels it through a, a smaller opening at the other end. And while doing this, it's got this kind of multifunctional behavior where it strains the water through its internal feeding filters, and it does this as a way to collect its food. So it collects phytoplankton, um, which it uses for, for energy. It's larger than most other um, zooplankton, so it processes more carbon. Essentially, it kind of um, take, it eats these little uh, phytoplankton on the surface. They absorb um, atmospheric carbon, and then it essentially poops them out. And because it's bigger than the other organisms that live in, the, uh, in, in this sort of area of the water column, it's contributing um, disproportionately to its numbers to, um, uh, to removing carbon from the atmosphere. It's also capable of rapid growth and asexual cloning, so it can respond quite rapidly to changes in the in environment around it in terms of abundance of food or supply of energy, um, and it migrates in the water column. So it's also got this kind of mobile behavior and moves around um, in the environment it lives in. So I was interested to, try to start trying to create robots that had this sort of functionality where they could gather energy from the world around them. They could contribute positively to environmental sort of remedi remediation or care in some way. Um, and in the, they could move around and in the best case, uh, they could sort of um, have a kind of programmed death where they would at least partially um, decay within that environment. And so 
I started looking at bioelectrical systems for um, artificial metabolism in robots. And at the time, um, this was during my, my PhD, and I was working with uh, one of my supervisors, Yanis Iropoulos, who had the um, bioenergy lab here at BRL. Um, and we were looking at this idea of a robot that could forage, so a robot that would gather food, would eat the food, derive energy from, from eating, and then use that to replenish its, its sort of energy supply to then um, keep feeding again. Um, and so Yanis was working with the EcoBot series, which you can see um, here, and was putting sort of arrays of these kind of biological batteries, um, these little microbial fuel cells, um, which I'll explain a bit more about in a moment, onto, onto robots as their sort of their energy supply. And so I started kind of playing with building these sorts of systems myself. I was focusing on kind of making them smaller and reducing down the numbers of fuel cells that were on board and in using them to try and power um, soft robots. So trying to move towards things that maybe had a more similar functionality to some of these organisms that we found uh, in, in, in the wild, in living, in, uh, in, uh, in living organisms, um, in trying to sort of create things that were softer and, and, and maybe closer to that sort of, um, sort of organism. So the systems that we were working with, microbial fuel cells, you can see a schematic of one here. It's a two electrode bioelectrical system. It has a um, community of bacteria that live on one side of it. These can be taken from lots of different sources, so from, uh, from soil, from river sediment, from sewage. Um, and in this um, sort of two electrode system, uh, it generates an electrical potential using um, redox potentials that are generated at each of these two um, electrodes. Um, they're limited to quite low voltages, so sort of chemically limited. If we think about the sort of types of reactions that take place inside of the cell, we can see sort of typical values for the uh, voltages that are generated at each electrode. Um, there's some values that are kind of corrected for the conditions that we typically find inside of the cell. And the difference between these two um, potentials for each the anode and cathode electrode gives us the total voltage of the cell. So this in most cases is limited, in most cases, in all cases, limited to about one volt theoretically. And in practice, it's much lower than this because this is sort of considering open circuit conditions where there's no electrical load attached. And also the types of things that are, I think, more interesting to feed to these types of systems are not made of the sort of pure substances that are represented in these, um, uh, in these reactions. They're more sort of representative of um, food-like substances that a robot or organism might find in its environment. So we used um, these types of systems to build a little rowing robot um, called the robot, um, because it rode, as I'll show you in a moment. <laughs> um, and uh, this had a, a sort of microbial fuel cell configured to form something that functioned maybe a little bit closer to the sort of salp-like body configuration that we saw earlier. So it had one electrode inside of its sort of artificial stomach, and it had another electrode that was in an air pocket on the side of the robot, giving it this sort of oxygenated environment that was needed for um, the sort of opposite side of those um, reactions. This is kind of viewed from above, if you like, this is sort of looking top down on the robot, and it's got a little mouth at each end, um, which allowed it to um, uh, sort of allowed fluid or food to kind of move into and out of um, the fuel cell. So we needed to give um, the robot a way of kind of getting the food in and out. It seemed like a bit too much of a jump uh, to move to how self actually do that at the time, although Valentina has done some amazing work on that since. Um, so, uh, so we looked at other bio-inspired ways of, of feeding a, a robotic stomach. And we use this um, as inspiration. So these uh, images represent suction feeding, which is the most common mode of feeding in bony fish. Um, the fish kind of opens uh, its mouth um, so it does sort of rapid expansion to open the mouth cavity really, uh, really wide and then uses a negative pressure gradient to draw in, draw in fluid from around the fish, including anything that might be suspended um, in the fluid um, for the fish to eat. Uh, the force generated for the force for this is generated by muscles that span most of the body. They have this sort of nice quality functionality where they're also used in swimming. And this has mostly been modeled as a four bar um, linkage. Um, so we used the model of this mechanism to create a linkage at each end of the robot um, and then used a sort of central actuator to um, actuate all of this uh, mechanism with one um, with one input. Lastly, we needed a way for the robot to get around. So again, we were sort of a little bit far from kind of jetting along at the time. So we took inspiration from um, some water beetles 
um, because they kind of use effective strategies for moving quite a wide kind of ungainly body through um, the water. So um, we created a uh, sort of rowing mechanism inspired by the water boatman beetle. And we also looked at the way the whirligig beetle um, sort of increases and decreases the, um, the area in contact with the water significantly during its power and recovery swimming stroke goes through this kind of 40 to one um, ratio between power and recovery stroke um, when it swims. So this was nice and it showed us how, that we could um, kind of um, prove the concept of energy autonomy in a feeding um, and swimming robot. The robot had a kind of uh, intermittent um, charging and energy use cycle where it would spend a lot longer charging up and then it would use the energy accumulated over a shorter period of time to do all of the operations that it needed to kind of um, refill itself and sort of swim along. So this is a kind of um, sped up, <laughs> accelerated um, diagram to show what's going on in the, in the experiment on the right. If I was to actually show the kind of charging cycle of the robot, then the, um, the horizontal axis would be much longer because it took us sort of five days to charge up uh, the robot with enough energy to do, with enough energy to do about 15 seconds worth of actual kind of mechanical feeding work, enough to then do it again <laughs> five days later. But nevertheless, we wanted to start looking at systems that were able to run more continuously using this type of, um, of energy supply. So we started looking into um, the way that MFCs had kind of been used, I guess, before they started being used in robots, which were more to do with sensing and wastewater treatment. And the sort of sensory behavior of these previously was kind of to check if something was like if the wastewater had been treated or not. It was quite a kind of binary um, sort of use of this type of, of thing. Um, but we started to uh, try to use microbial fuel cells as a way to um, measure the chemical oxygen demand or COD of um, a water sample. So the COD is um, a measure of the amount of oxygen that's needed to oxidize the organic matter present in a quantity of water. And because of that, it's used as an indirect measure of um, organic material, which could be pollutants um, in a water sample. Typically, this is carried out over several hours or even days in a lab. It uses quite nasty reagents to try and sort of do this process. Um, at the time, I was using these sorts of experiments to kind of test uh, water samples that were coming into and out of these sort of bioelectrical systems. And I couldn't find any examples of where this could be done in the field. So in a kind of field testing device, for example, for monitoring quality of drinking water or for sort of I guess taking care of the types of problems that we're seeing more and more in um, in sort of news and current affairs around sort of sewage entering water systems and that's sort of getting increasingly closer to the water that we all um, consume. So we came up with a system that used the MFC electrical output output sorry for both sensing and power so using the same signal from a single um, cell to generate both the power for um, for the system, but also um, its sensor signal. And the plot at the bottom left shows um, the output from a microbial fuel cell for a series of water samples. So each sample represents a, a peak. And what we can see from this is that different sort of loadings of COD or different values, um, it's quite difficult to tell the different peaks apart. The, the peaks are, are quite noisy. Um, and while we can maybe see a sort of general trend of it increasing, it's kind of difficult to, to pick to pick them out. So we um, looked at the fact that this had quite a kind of complex, um, sort of seemingly quite noisy signal and used this to extract some, fe some features from the peak. We did a bit of evaluation of which features were um, the most important and we used those to train quite a lightweight um, machine learning algorithm that we then put onto a little microcontroller that the, um, the microbial fuel cell could power um, as well. So um, this is the, I guess, like the, from the sort of experiment once the microcontroller is, is attached, so we can see the peaks again. I haven't actually labeled those, but well, they, okay, they are not labeled with the different COD values. <laughs> but the system once started up and passed a sort of, sort of startup threshold voltage was able to run continuously in order to kind of switch on, take samples throughout the voltage peak, identify the end of the peak, and then um, use that to um, evaluate the water sample. So this we're sort of trying to take forward into things that could be kind of stationed in the environment and run en energy autonomously for this type of um, environmental monitoring. Um, yeah, so what's next for this type of system? So this is some work that um, I've started looking at with Hendrik, who I think is on the call online. <laughs> so um, where 
Um, we're sort of thinking about the function of microbial fuel cells, not just as kind of energy sources, but also as capacitors. So in some recent work um, that the analysis group has continued to do, um, these types of systems have been shown to um, be able to kind of charge up as a, and have a sort of self um, capacitance to them. So if we sort of consider the plot in the middle to begin with, um, a voltage is applied to the MFC. If that uh, sort of um, voltage level is then discharged, then the MFC will self recharge using the energy that's um, uh, sort of being converted within the system itself. So we're starting to explore the idea of kind of trying to create um, a sort of physical model of this kind of um, leaky integrate and fire electrical model that's, that's used to represent um, a sort of biological neuron. In fact, an MFC could kind of represent any of these or be kind of interchangeable with any of these circuit components, but we're sort of looking initially at the, the sort of the capacitive part where um, the MFC functions as the sort of the integrator, the capacitance in this circuit, and where that um, charging can either come from an external electrical source or from perhaps like a fluid signal that would feed into um, this uh, sort of circuit component or biological model. Um, as another part to this, we're sort of thinking about the way that MSCs demonstrate memory. So um, because it's a living community of bacteria that are essentially kind of generating the, uh, the power from the cell, they can, um, the cell itself will kind of respond differently based on the input that's given to the cell and the sort of history dependence of that. So um, again, in some work that's done by uh, another group, I forgot which group, but for the paper at the top in case you did want to find this, um, the, uh, the graph is showing um, a sort of resistance to perturbations by toxic chemicals that are put into the, the cell. So we can see that as a toxin is introduced, as formaldehyde in this um, example, there's a big drop in voltage as the, the community is kind of damaged, but then later the community um, recovers and the, the, um, the sort of uh, resistance to that toxin um, is sort of can be seen in the, uh, in the response. Um, another thing that can kind of um, happen that I've observed in, in, in work that I've done is that you have a sort of health to the cell. So if a cell is kind of well fed, and then it will continue to kind of respond well to um, or give you a, a kind of higher output voltage to an input sort of fluid signal. If you have a kind of unhealthy cell, an unhealthy community, then that same signal will give you a, a lower response. So you have a sort of history dependent response that you get out of, um, of the system. So we're trying to use this to kind of explore the idea on the previous slide at the moment. Um, and that's kind of where we are with that um, right now. So I'm going to do a bit of a switch to a completely different topic at the moment, but they do kind of connect together a little bit um, at the end. So because um, this is more for talks, I kind of wanted to talk a bit more about some work that we're doing on, um, on robot morphology and how that interacts with environments. So this is an idea that came out of a project uh, that was with or is with a dance company that looks at something completely different from what I'm going to talk about, but the sort of brief that was given by the dance company was that we needed to create some robots that would move in sand and they needed to have bio-inspired motion. So we didn't want any kind of tank tracks or wheels moving around in the sandy environment. So this was nice and we started kind of exploring ideas uh, that came from, from nature and Alex, who's also on the call, your robot is on the screen, I feel excited. Um, so uh, we found that this had some really nice kind of outcomes for some of the stuff that we're looking at with um, partners that are working in environmental monitoring. So for example, um, I have a, a sort of research partnership with Emma, Emma Liu, who's a volcanologist at UCL, um, and she works with the aerial robotics group here, and they look at ideas about like kind of dropping sensors into volcanoes. But one of the challenges with this is that it's very difficult to get the sensors out. So while you're able to study the environment um, within the volcano, it's very difficult to then retrieve what you've essentially just left as more junk in, in you know, what's already kind of uh, perhaps kind of a fragile environment. Um, another uh, sort of partnership with British Antarctic Survey, these same kind of ideas came up where they're sort of putting sensors into the water to try and track um, uh, sort of parameters to um, understand more about the climate, but those same systems are becoming kind of junk in these sorts of environments again. So in the sort of robots that we were building for the dancers, we started kind of to see that there was maybe some things that we could explore in terms of overcoming obstacles, like these kind of unstable non-stationary terrains, so the sort of sandy environment that I talked about, steep inclines, but also the need for sort of amphibious operation in some of these um, spaces. So we, like 
quite a lot of other <laughs> researchers took inspiration from from turtles for this and um turtles i think have become really fascinating to a lot of uh, roboticists for a few reasons that i'll talk about um on the next slide but I think they're really um, cool because they can overcome some of the challenges that I think some of the best performing sort of multi-terrain robots are still kind of struggling with. So this is Rex. This is a robot that was invented in the 90s, but has been turned up in like so many studies since then because it does some really, really amazing things. But it still struggles to a degree with granular media above certain inclines, and it also struggles with um, transitioning between different, um, different terrains. So some really interesting takings from the how the turtle moves have been explored by Dan Goldman's group, I think is you know, sort of quite well known research in this area, looking at not only turtles, but sort of granular media in general and trying to sort of categorize um, physical interactions with granular media. Um, and also some other groups have looked at things like using reinforcement learning for um, kind of changing the way that a turtle inspired robot reacts to um, the world around it and also things like changing dynamically changing morphology to, to move in different terrains. And there's some really cool things to understand from how um, the turtle's body sort of is in its morphology, but also kind of how it moves. So most of the body is fused to a bony shell, and that means all of the, or most of the propulsive force generated comes from the limbs in any habitat. So this makes it quite a nice system to study as people building artificial systems, because there's fewer components needed to re uh, reproduce these kind of dynamics. Um, it has obvious sort of large payload potential uh, for carrying around sort of sensors and other packages uh, and, and a, has a kind of a low center of mass. And there's quite a lot of um, uh, sort of diversity in the types of morphologies that, that turtles have. But one of the main distinctions or kind of groupings um, is in the forelimb. So for the forelimbs are typically either shaped more uh, like this, like a sort of leg for um, rowing type swimming, which is found in freshwater turtles, um, or these kind of long sort of paddle-like shapes, which is which are used more for uh, this kind of flying type swimming, which is found in, in sea turtles. Um, and they're also kind of grouped by how uh, the different types of gait that they use. So they'll use either kind of synchronous or asynchronous uh, forelimb gaits, depending on um, the, uh, the type. So some amazing things about their locomotion, um, Many species of turtle, it seems like most of them actually uh, regularly perform both aquatic and terrestrial locomotion. And while um, the sort of speeds that they use typically when moving on, on land or, or in water kind of vary quite a lot, they um, are typically, or they can achieve kind of comparable speeds in each. So taking an example of a hatchling um, sea turtle, which can move at five body lengths per second um, when swimming, it can achieve a comparable speed on land, even though it's kind of just basically just been born. <laughs> So um, they, as I mentioned um, before, can achieve locomotion in granular media, and they do this through this kind of granular solidification. So they've got this kind of force interaction with the world around them, whereby they're interacting with a material that can behave completely as a liquid or completely as a solid um, by sort of um, this kind of force interaction that they have uh, with, with the ground. And also they can undergo these incredibly fast transitions between different terrains. So they move in the, sort of the top two images, there's the it's, it's really cute, <laughs> just the turtle kind of moving down to the sand, it goes into the water and then is immediately able to kind of like do this very, um, what sort of seemingly sort of different um, behavior in locomotion. Um, and lastly, they can climb really steep inclines. So they've been recorded as climbing inclines uh, of about 60 degrees um, in experimental work. Um, so, uh, you know, for kind of sort of climbing sand dunes for nesting and so on. So they're really interesting for these, uh, these types of, um, uh yeah these sorts of, of reasons so this is what we're uh trying to do so we're trying to use soft and smart composites to achieve this sort of multi-terrain um locomotion so to trying to achieve this kind of transition between um different like surfaces or different sort of environments in general around um the around the robot so in looking at the sort of biomechanics studies that have been done on turtles they have these i think they're kind of like the sort of obvious findings in a way when you start to think about them, but maybe they're not so obvious until you sort of see it spelled out. So um, they've got this very kind of the, like the global motion of the forelimb is essentially quite similar across different terrains. So if we think about these two, these top two plots where we can see the upper limb and the sort of filled data points are the uh, limb in terrestrial motion and the, sorry, the unfilled uh, points of the, the, the limb in terrestrial motion and the filled points of the limb in terrestrial motion. And they've got this quite similar behavior through the, um, through the, the, the walking 
or swimming um, cycle. But there's these small active and passive kind of morphological changes that are used to modify this global position, depending on um, the terrain that the, the, the turtle or the robot is, is kind of moving through. And that is represented by these two at the bottom. So we can see the movement of the elbow and the wrist. They're not huge kind of angular ranges, but they, because they've got this sort of different pattern across the cycle, they can sort of modify um, that uh, gait to achieve these kind of comparable speeds across quite different media. Um, so, um, yeah, so <laughs> we're trying to use these um, changes and try to sort of realize these in composite structures. And this is some work that I'm doing with um, Callum Gillespie. You may have seen his big sand pit set up on his desk uh, in the lab. Um, and we're trying to sort of design these structures to mimic these, bi morph these biological morphological changes um, and to do this in as passive a way um, as possible. So because we're doing these experiments now, I would love it if you came and talked to us about that in there, but I'm going to kind of leave it there on... Uh, on this particular um, part of um, part of my study, um, but uh, yeah, so I'm just um, I'm really hoping that I can yeah just keep kind of bringing you more <laughs> um, uh, sort of that we that we do looking at all terrain robots that interact in these different ways with living ecosystems um, and the work that we're doing in using this for environmental monitoring, sampling, uh, remediation, and climate modelling. Um, in particular, I hope to see these kind of go forward in these different partnerships that we've got with, um, with different uh, sort of environmental monitoring organizations and groups. So that just leaves me to thank all of the people who have helped work on the things that I've shown and the people that have given me money um, and to all of you for listening, thank you. <laughs>